Namibia lies in southwest Africa. The Namib Desert stretches for almost 2,000 kilometers along the coast. To the north, the desert is crisscrossed by several dry river valleys. One of them is the Huanib Valley. It runs through the desert for several hundred kilometers and ends in the sea. Water flows here once, at most twice a year. Only deep-rooted plants like anna trees can survive here. Only here, within the valley, can mammals exist in the long term. It is the home of the desert elephants. In contrast to their other African relatives, desert elephants live in particularly small family groups. They are so rare and their way of life is so special that they're under the constant supervision of scientists who've also given the elephants names. The head of this family is alpha cow Clarissa. The animals don't leave her side for a moment. Only Clarissa knows how to survive in this extreme environment. The shoots of the anna tree are now ripe. The pods contain protein-rich seeds. Clarissa has known every one of these trees since her childhood. Even the youngest, Maya, tries the shoots. Here, however, experienced trunk tip control is required. It's easier for her to get the protein she needs from her mother's milk. Desert elephants only have half the number of calves as other elephants. The male animals stay with their mother's family until they reach sexual maturity. With mock fights, they prepare for life without the protection of the females. Adult bull elephants are loners or travel in small groups. Jappy is the most skillful of them. His younger brother watches enviously as Jappy brings down apparently unreachable branches from the tree. In the valley, Jappy is well known for such tricks. He learned them from his father. Friendship among bull elephants has its limits. Jappy is certainly not willing to share his branch with his younger brother. Their father, One Tusk, is now nearly 60 years old. His trademark is the missing right tusk, lost long ago in a hierarchical battle. For years, he was the undisputed king of the Huanib. Now he lives in seclusion. One Tusk's legs are weak. He can no longer keep up. The aging bull is already being watched by a male jackal, which lives in the Huani Valley with its partner. Jackals mostly hunt smaller animals, but they wouldn't turn their noses up at a dead elephant. In a side valley, Clarissa has discovered a further source of food there's a wide selection of bushes, grasses, and herbs.
The elephants' climbing skills far surpass those of their savanna dwelling relatives. This too is a form of adaptation to their special habitat. Old One Tusk has at last reached one of the Anna trees in the Huanib Valley. But Clarissa and co. haven't left very much for him to eat. He desperately searches for something edible in the remnants. In vain. For the inhabitants of the Namib, survival is hard. They're used to going for long periods without water. Many get liquid from their food or know secret sources of water. Regardless of size, every green leaf contains a minimum of liquid worth harvesting. Outside the dry river valleys, there is scarcely any vegetation. Here, only extreme specialists survive. The Namib desert beetle is no bigger than a fingernail. As all animals, it depends on water for survival and has developed a special strategy. Even the tiniest traces of dampness in the air condense on its carapace. In time, a drop forms, which then flows directly into the beetle's mouth. This way of life limits the distribution of desert beetles to those parts of the desert that see fog. But where does the fog come from? The Namib is one of the few deserts in the world that stretch to the sea. The cold Benguela current from the Antarctic cools the seawater to a temperature of 12 degrees Celsius. When the water reaches land, it evaporates in the warm desert air. Around 200 days a year, the desert is wreathed in mist, which sometimes extends hundreds of kilometers inland into the dry river valleys. The Benguela current doesn't only bring fog, it's also rich in fish. The animals that benefit most are the brown fur seals. Their colonies are often home to 100,000 animals. Right now, there's good reason for so many seals to congregate here. The mating season is just beginning. Everywhere, bulls are fighting for the right to mate. The strongest conquer a whole harem and then have their flippers full. After mating, the males disappear into the sea, 
they're not involved in bringing up the young. The fog sometimes penetrates as far as the Huanib Valley. Now, even the biggest animals benefit from the moisture contained in the fog. Jappy and his brother can take on a lot of liquid from the drops of dew on the plants they eat. This allows the elephants to go without water for up to four days at a time. The pair are still on the move together. This will soon change. As the fog lifts, the sun illuminates a very special event. Families of elephants from other dry river valleys are on their way to the Huanib Valley. They're following the calls of their relatives, which they pick up via the soles of their feet as via a stethoscope. More and more elephants join Clarissa's family. Some of the animals haven't seen each other for years and exchange affectionate greetings. Jappy and his brother are also aware of the arrival of the females. When it comes to attracting a cow, in a flash, companions become rivals. Once upon a time, one tusk was also aroused by all the excitement. Today, it no longer has any significance for him. He wouldn't be able to deal with confrontations with other bulls. His sons and grandsons, on the other hand, are very excited. For them, it's important to make the most of the female's willingness to mate and prevent others from taking advantage. In the end, however, Jappy only manages to achieve his goal by means of a trick. He abducts the alpha cow, Clarissa. While many of the inhabitants of the valley spend the night hours asleep, this is the time of the real desert dwellers. The Namib sand gecko is only active at night. In the darkness, the little predator looks for crickets and spiders. Like a frog's, its toes are webbed. This enables the lizard to seemingly fly across the dunes without sinking into the sand. But it also needs to be on the lookout. sidewinding adder. Similar to desert elephants, beetles and geckos, the snake has a hard life in the Namib. It has to hunt successfully to survive. Once it finds a good spot for an ambush, it goes to ground. The snake is a predator that lies in wait for its prey, relying completely on its camouflage.
For the sensitive gecko, it's time to go. In the sun, it would quickly dehydrate. Here too, webbed feet come in handy. The lizard uses its legs as scoops to quickly dig out astonishing underground passages. It can make tunnels one meter long into the ground. Here, it's safe. Up at ground level, another gecko isn't in quite such a hurry. With good reason. The fog is coming. The lizard's large, mirror-like eye surfaces allow the fog to condense here. At last, water. The waiting paid off. This morning, the sidewinding adder can have breakfast and get some liquid into the bargain. The Namibian winter is coming to an end, and with it, the mild climate brought by the fog. Relentless heat descends on the Huanid Valley. 40 degrees Celsius in the shade. This is approaching the limit for even Clarissa's family. Elephants don't sweat, and so protect themselves against overheating by fanning their ears. But it seems too hot even for that. The heat is hard to bear for all the animals, but for the youngest, the sun can be lethal. Maya is really suffering. One tusk mobilizes all his efforts for one last attempt at an Anna tree. But he no longer has the strength. Exhausted, he withdraws to the shade. During his long life, his legs have carried him more than 400,000 kilometers. As with most bull elephants, the last few steps he will take alone. Despite the heat, Clarissa can't afford to take a break. She urges her family to move on. Desert elephants have to spend up to 20 hours a day eating 200 kilos of plant material. As tiring as that may be, Clarissa's family have no choice. One young bull is already so exhausted that he sleeps through the signal to move off. He only wakes up when the other elephants are already out of sight. This show was created for you and your family to watch together. Welcome to Nat Geo Wild. It finally dawns on him that he really is all alone. Clarissa and the rest of the family have noticed his absence. The animals try to locate each other via smell using their trunks, which are extraordinarily sensitive. In the end, it's Maya who gives the decisive call. 
Now the straggler knows which way to go. The extremely dry period shows no sign of coming to an end. One week later, the heat and the elephants have combined to decimate the plant life in the Huanib Valley. Vultures take up positions on the trees on the edge of the valley. Their time will come when the other animals can find nothing more to eat. For Clarissa's family, a dead tree now becomes the sole source of food. In the desert, a tree of this size takes years to break down. And it's the elephants that turn it into food again for the other animals. They themselves only use 60% of what they eat. The rest they excrete, undigested. In this way, they distribute seeds, like those of the Anna tree. Some animals, like the helmeted guinea fowl, take the majority of their food from what the elephants deposit. In times of scarcity, even the Huanib Valley baboons look for something edible in the elephant's dung. Old One Tusk has one more go at the wood. But elephant molars only grow back six times. One Tusk's teeth are worn out, and his attempt to eat wood the way he used to is doomed to failure. In other parts of Africa, older elephants seek out swamps where they can live for a while longer on softer leaves. Here, there is no such possibility. For Clarissa, too, the situation is becoming threatening. She and her family must leave the valley and seek food and water elsewhere. Other families join the trek. Only Clarissa's knowledge of hidden water sources can save them now. Scarcely any animals are left in the valley. Even the jackals are leaving. In their search for food, they will move along the Huanib Valley until they reach the coast. Only one tusk is too old and too tired for the trek. The one thing that could save him now is rain that would let soft grass grow. With this slim hope, he remains behind. The Namib desert beetle is also looking for something to eat. In contrast to most of the desert dwellers, it is not seeking fresh young shoots. The beetle is on the lookout for plant residues. The unceasing wind is a help. It sweeps fragments of plant life together in valleys and hollows between the dunes. Mostly, it's just a few bits of leaf. But sometimes it collects and becomes something like a herbal rubbish dump. Although the plants are completely dried out, they still contain important nutrients. The Namakwa chameleon is one of the most dangerous hunters in the Namib desert. For desert beetles, at any rate. 
but the Beatles don't usually make it quite so easy. The beetles aren't only full of protein, but also provide essential liquids for the lizard. Namaqua chameleons are the biggest reptiles the Namib can support. In contrast to the mammals, they can't undertake long migrations to look for food and water. Similar to the Huanib, a river once flowed here. Along its banks, animals like chameleons penetrated deep into the desert. Hundreds of years ago, the dunes slowly invaded the riverbed and cut off the water supply. This process was so slow, however, that the animals had time to adapt to the new conditions. The mammals didn't need such a long period of adaptation. Their ability to migrate over long distances enabled them to conquer the desert much more quickly. The pair of jackals will soon reach the coast. Clarissa, meanwhile, is still searching for water. Little Maya is already exhausted. The group has to keep stopping. The animals are reaching the limits of their strength. Clarissa can produce less and less milk for her daughter. Suddenly, a commotion as Maya sinks to her knees. But Clarissa urges her offspring onwards. It is their only chance. As dusk falls, they finally arrive. Thanks to Clarissa's knowledge, there's something to drink at last. Adult elephants can get by on 100 liters of water a day. The subsequent dust bath serves to protect the elephant's skin from the relentless sun. The trek to the next source of food is long. The following morning, Clarissa will move on. The jackals have finally reached the sea and move southwards along the coast. The new generation of brown fur seals is just arriving. Many of the mother animals are heavily pregnant. This young mother hasn't long to go. The mother at once welcomes her offspring into the world. Each voice and scent is as unique as a fingerprint. The ritual creates an unbreakable bond between mother and pup. Directly after the birth, the pup has to be suckled.
the newborn is a little clumsy. The young mother is not alone. Tens of thousands of other females have also given birth. Space is at a premium in the colony, a risky situation for the babies. To minimize the danger, the seals organize a kindergarten. Many of the mother animals leave their newly born pups here. The nursery not only offers the young pups protection, but also makes it easier to find them later. The mother seals have to go out hunting every day to make sure their milk is nutritious enough for the young. But when choosing the location of the kindergarten, they forgot about the tide. The pups fight desperately against the onslaught of the waves. The baby is washed out to sea, along with the other newborn seals. Seal pups can swim, but they don't have the protective layer of fat of adult animals. The pup fights for survival. Another is slowly but surely losing the battle. Within a few minutes, the pups are so exhausted that they can no longer keep their heads above water and drown. The next morning reveals how great the danger posed by the sea is for the seal pups. The shore is full of little corpses, washed up by the tide. The jackals from the Huanib. The pair have traveled hundreds of kilometers from the arid valley. The seal colony is now their only chance of food. Jackals aren't choosy. For them, eating carrion is nothing unusual. They'll be spending the coming weeks at the seal colony. Only when the pups are old enough to swim enduringly and thus the supply of food runs out, will the jackals return to the Huanin Valley. It's not only the jackals that undertake such long treks. The other inhabitants of the Huanib have a long way to go. An oasis hidden deep in the desert. Ausis. It lies like an emerald in the middle of the desert. A thin band of loose vegetation lines the watering hole. The pied crows are getting worked up about something. Visitors, big visitors. 
the legendary Desert Lions. Desert Lions are so unbelievably rare that scientists have fitted them with transmitter collars so that the big cats can be monitored and protected. Two females have taken up positions in the undergrowth with their young. The experienced predators know that it's just a matter of watching and waiting. And indeed, many animals are making their way here. The oryx's numbers have thinned noticeably. Some are lagging far behind the main column. After more than 10 days trek, the first animals finally reach the source. Cautiously, they approach the steep bank. They're in danger of sinking into the soft ground. The pied crows sound the alarm again. The lioness's patience has been rewarded. They've caught one of the stragglers. One lioness keeps the oryx in check on the ground. The hunting lioness is completely exhausted. Fighting the antelope has taken the last of her strength. She drags herself back to the bushes to get her cubs. The other lioness keeps the pesky crows at bay. Luckily for the huntress, the cubs quickly grasp the situation. They can hardly wait to get their teeth into some fresh food. All the animals here are fighting for survival. The lionesses won this round. They've enough food now to last the coming weeks. Clarissa and her family have finally reached the neighboring Dry River Valley. The experienced cow knew instinctively that, in times of drought, there was some precious greenery here to feed on. The exhausted animals can at last fill their stomachs again. And this is how a happy, full-up baby elephant looks. Maya in paradise. A strong wind blows in from the coast and sandstorms form in the hinterland. They reach the river valley where Clarissa and family have found food and shelter. Sandstorms like these are the harbingers of heavy rain. Experienced elephant cows like Clarissa know what that means. As soon as it rains, the dry river valleys will be turned into raging torrents that wash away anything in their path imminent danger for the family of elephants. Time to move on again. Now the safest place to be is outside the valleys. How right Clarissa was can be seen the following day. Water in the dry river valley. Only every 10 years or so is the rain strong enough for the flood wave to reach the sea. Just a few days later, 
the first green shoots begin the transformation of the dry river valleys. The Huanib Valley, too, is bursting with new life as the first exiles return. For one animal, however, the rain came too late. Old one tusk succumbed to hunger before the first drops fell. The jackals find his body on the edge of the valley. The jackals don't approach the body until evening. And thus, the circle of life is complete. The next morning, long unheard calls echo through the valley. Clarissa is back. Her family survived the floods unscathed. Maya, too, is thriving. At last, the newly greened Huanib Valley comes into view. Clarissa's family is home again. Jappy will pass on the genes of his father, One Tusk, and with them, his strength and intelligence. Clarissa is pregnant with his baby. The alpha cow will induct each new generation into the secrets of the desert elephants. This is essential for their survival. The Huanib River Valley is probably the last real wilderness in Namibia, one in which only the cleverest, most intelligent of the animal world can survive. A life of extremes in the home of the desert elephants.